Seven, 7.1 talks about something called the central limit theorem. Capturing and holding one's attention. Yes. Enthralling. Enthralling pain, maybe. Uh, so the central limit theorem is going to be a tool for us uh, that becomes very useful for the mere fact that we rarely know what our population distribution looks like. Okay? So if we're talking about like uh, how um, for example, here we got an example that talks about triglyceride levels um, for people in a population. If I have no idea how triglyceride levels are distributed amongst my population, whether they're uniform or they're normal or maybe they're exponential or whatever, we don't know the shape. If we were to take every single person and find their triglycerides and make a frequency table and then graph them in a histogram and then make a uh, density curve. We don't know what that curve would look like. Would it be normal? Would it be uniform? Would it be exponential, chi-square, whatever? We don't know a lot of those things about populations. Okay? What the central limit theorem allows us to do is, and since we don't know that information about the population, it's hard to analyze other things about the population. Central limit theorem allows kind of a creates kind of a workaround to to that idea, okay, to that uh, lack of knowledge about the distribution of the population. So today, all I want to do is kind of lay the foundation of the central limit theorem, um, introduce some notation, and then over the next couple of days, we'll do some um, actual problems dealing with it, okay. But I think the scenario here that is laid out gives a good idea of what we're doing. Um, if I didn't have a scenario, I think it would be very hard for you to realize some of the terminology and what we're doing. That I, I think the terminology gets really wordy uh, and hard to uh, remember and keep straight. Uh, but the scenario here hopefully gives a visual of what we're doing. Okay? So and suppose a researcher selects a sample of 30 adult, adults and finds the mean of the measure of triglyceride levels uh, for the sample of subjects to be 187 milligrams per deciliter. So what we're doing here, and, and the picture down below uh, explains this as well, but we have this population of adults, okay? Um, and, and you can kind of maybe narrow that down to maybe they're adults in Ohio, maybe they're adults in Down County, whatever. But we have a ton of population of adults. Maybe it's all adults in the world, okay? We don't know what that distribution looks like, okay? But what we can do, so we don't know what that mean is, okay? But what we can do is we can sample 30 of those adults. I can go find 30 adults and test the triglyceride levels of each of those 30 adults and then average those. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what this first line is saying here is we selected 30 adults from some population and we average their triglyceride levels, and it came out to 187 milligrams per deciliter, okay? So that would maybe represent sample one right here in the picture, okay? That green bubble represents 30 people, and this notation right there, this X bar with the subscript of one, is representing the mean of those 30 people. So that's representing the 187, does that make sense? So are we okay with that idea on board with that? Let me write 187 in here. Okay. So then what we do is we take those 30 people and we put them back into the population and we choose another 30 people. Okay. And because we put those people back in, they could be part of the second sample, okay? Uh, so we're doing replacement here. So we sample another 30 people, we average their triglyceride levels, okay? And we get, in that one, a second group says it's 192. So the second group here is this blue bubble, 192. And the way I drew that blue bubble, you can kind of see that in that situation, somebody, maybe one or two or three hour many, um, that were in sample one also got picked in sample two. So that can happen, it can be overlap, okay? Now, we do it again. We do it with a third sample, 
Okay, and we get 195. So we take another 30 people, and we get a average of those 30 to be 195. And we keep doing that. We keep doing that process over and over and over and over again. Okay? And we get all of these groups of 30 averages. Okay? And we call them sample means. Does that make sense? We took a sample and found their average. We took a sample and found their means. So we call them sample means. So I've got now these new numbers. So, so this 187 is a mean. 192 is a mean. 195 is a mean. But collectively, if I do this 100 times, I would have 100 of those numbers. Does that make sense? I essentially have 100 new triglyceride values. Okay? Well, that group of 100 is now another distribution. That group of 100 can be considered a random variable now. Does that make sense? And it's going to be a continuous random variable because of the way averages are going to work. We're probably going to get decimals and stuff like that. Um, Does anybody have questions on that process? So basically, not able to look at the entire population, okay, and find the average of the entire population, but we can take a bunch of little samples and find the averages of those little samples. And once we find the averages of those little samples, in this case, I'd have 100 of these little X bars, okay, they themselves, as a group, become what we call a sampling distribution of sample means. Okay, so we'd have 100 data points now that we could actually plot there. Does that make sense? Okay, so down here at the bottom of the, of the picture, it says X sub bar, X, we, a couple different ways, you might want to read that, uh, X sub 1 bar or X bar sub 1, X bar sub 2, X bar sub 3, basically those subscripts, a lot of times you won't see them. Um, being used, but because I'm talking about different samples, I want to have something to differentiate them. Um, so X sub 1 comes from sample 1, 2, some sample 2, 3, sample 3, so forth. But the bar on top tells us it's the mean of those. You guys remember back to when we talked about uh, parameters and statistics, the first thing we talked about with the parameter, the first uh, quantity we talked about parameters was the mean, the average, mu, okay, for a population. Um, and then for a statistic, we talked about X bar being the mean for the sample. Okay? So X bar, we've seen that notation before, uh, but all it means is the average or the mean for a sample. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So it corresponds to mu, but mu is the, the mean for the population. X bar is the mean for the sample. It says all of these become the data points for another distribution, and we call that the sampling distribution. It says, if samples are drawn with replacement, okay, um, so meaning an object, a person, could be chosen for sample one and sample two, or again, in sample three or whatever, okay, so we can have some overlap like we see in the picture. Uh, if that's the case, there is ultimately an infinite number of different samples that can be drawn from the population, okay? Even if we, um, you know, if we have a population that has like a thousand members in it, and we're choosing 30 at a time. There's an infinite number of different groups of 30 that can be created because we're doing replacement. We can say that people can be chosen in multiple groups, okay? Um, so that idea, that construct of uh, that scenario is what we're going to be working with here in a moment, okay? What I want you guys to understand, what you need to know, is that no sample, okay, neither one of those, any of those bubbles up there that represent 30 people out of a population, none of those means of 187, 192, 195, none of those means are going to be equal to the population mean. Okay? There's always going to be what we call sampling error. Meaning, you know, if we took, let's say there's, I don't know, 15 of us in this class normally, maybe. Um, if we were to take like our, um, I know we, we did this before uh, at the beginning of the year. If we took our age and days, okay, and we found the you guys know the population, and we found our average age and days for the class. Wrote that number down, called that mu, okay, and then maybe I took 
these back three people as a sample. And I took their ages and I averaged them. That sample mean of these three will not equal the mu that we found of the whole class. Does that make sense? No sample of three people that we choose and add their ages up will equal the mean of that class. Okay? And that's called sampling area because this group, this sample of these three people are not a perfect match to the population. No sample is ever 100% representative of the population. Okay? And that difference is referred to as sampling error. Okay? Um, so some key terms as we move through here. Sampling distribution of sample means. Sam I think that's wordy. Sampling distribution of sample means. It says it's a distribution using the means computed from all the possible random samples of a specific size taken from a population. What that means right there is that when we take these samples of 30 people and we get x sub 1 or x bar sub 1, we get x bar sub 2, we get x bar sub 3, which those were numbers like 187, 195, 192. We're going to have 100 numbers like that. Okay? As raw data, those 100 numbers can be plotted on a graph, a histogram, or what, what have you, and you will have a distribution. Does that make sense? You can determine the frequency of them and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Is that all right? It says, if samples are randomly selected with replacement, the sample means, for the most part, will be somewhat different from the population mean mu. These differences are caused by sampling error. Sampling error is the difference between the sample measure and the corresponding population measure due to the fact that the sample is not a perfect representation of the population. That's what we just talked about. Okay? No sample is an identical match to the population. Okay? Only the population is an identical match to the population. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so that, that ends up giving us maybe some issues uh, eventually, but you're going to see some nice conclusions that can come from this. In order to talk about this in, in greater detail, we need some notation stuff. Okay. Um, so X bar, something we've talked about before, that's just a sample mean. Okay. Uh, mu, if you remember, mu was the population mean. The next term here we see is mu sub X bar. Mu sub X bar. And all that is is the mean of the sample means. Okay, so what does that mean? The mean of the sample means. And again, I think that gets wordy. Okay, the mean of the sample means. What that means right here is that we're taking that X bar sub 1 plus that X bar sub 2 plus that X bar sub 3. And we said we were going to do that 100 times, right? So we we're going to have 100 of these sample means. We are then going to add those together and average those. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so that's what we refer to as the mean of the sample mean. All right. So in specifics, we'd be taking that 190, what was it, 192, 195, the 187, whatever these were, there'd be 100 total, and we would add those up, divide by 100. Okay, and obviously then you can kind of project that that quotient, that average would probably be in the 180s to 190s. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, so that's what that means. Okay. The sigma sub x bar, sigma, sigma stands for standard deviation, x bar representing sample means. So this must be the standard deviation of the sample means. Okay. So if you remember standard deviation, Standard deviation, the formula for that normally, okay, is equal to the square root of x minus mu squared all over n, okay? And I forgot my sigma there, but we got sigma, so we got to add all those up. Well, when we talk about the standard deviation of the sample means, the x values here in the sample means this x value right there 
is going to be that x sub 1, x bar sub 1, the x bar sub 2, the x bar sub 3. Does that kind of make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, when we do this, we end up with some properties okay, that are always consistent for the distribution of sample means. Okay. First property is that the mean of the sample means the mean of the sample means will be identical to the population mean, which is kind of, I think, uh, unique. So it's maybe uh, something that can be very beneficial to us when we do something in regards to a population, because we've talked about this with a population, it is very rare that we have all the knowledge we need about population, right? because of how big populations are and how um, it might be either financially or just logistically impossible to maybe find the triglyceride levels of every single adult, right? That makes sense? So we don't know the mean of the population. But what this says is if you go find a bunch of samples of 30 adults, okay, and find the means of those individual samples, x1 or x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar 3. Add all those up and divide by however many you took. That average will be identical to that unknown population mean. Does that make sense? Okay. The next property says the standard deviation of the sample means will be smaller than the standard deviation of the population. Okay. So standard deviation of the population is going to be spread, because that's what standard deviation talks about, is the spread of data. Okay? Um, when we take the sample means standard deviation, that spread is going to be tighter than what the population standard deviation was, okay? or the, the population spread of, of data is. Okay? So that's a fact that when we're working through these things, we're going to kind of try to see some examples here in a little bit that um, when we calculate them, this should be confirmed, this property here should be confirmed, and then this property here that says the standard deviation of the sample means is equal to the population standard deviation, okay, divided by the square root of the sample size. Square The sample size being how many people were in, in each individual sample. So we were taking 30 people in the previous problem, so n would be 30 in the situation. Does that kind of make sense? The last bullet is just a, a notation or a vocabulary type thing. Uh, sometimes the, the standard deviation of the sample mean is referred to as the standard error of the mean. Okay, standard error of the mean. Same thing as the standard deviation of the sample means. Okay, um, so that phrase, those are synonymous phrases. Okay, so we, whether you're, you're on track with what we're talking about right now or confused, hopefully in this next situation you'll see what we're really talking about. Now we're going to go through a full scenario of uh, calculating these things and trying to understand what we're doing here with sample means. All right. So the scenario here says, suppose I gave a test to a class of four students, okay? The test is worth eight points, and the four students earned scores of two, four, six, and eight, okay? So four people, two, four, six, and eight are the scores that they receive. If I want to know what the average then is, or the mean for that population, I can actually do two plus four plus six plus eight divided by four gives me five, right? So the average score on that test is five. Now that's, a lot of times, my population is so small that we can actually, we have the resources to be able to calculate that. A lot of times the population is so big that you wouldn't be able to do that, okay? <laughs> but we have now our population mean, okay? The standard deviation of the population, okay? This is our standard deviation formula that we talked about back in chapter two. So it's the sum of x sub i minus mu squared. So x sub i, remember that's each individual score, each individual data value. So the two, the four, the six, and the eight. 
Mu was our five. That was the population average. N is how many people were in our population. So we take two minus five, first data value, first score of two, minus the average of five, square that. Second person had a score, or one of my people had a score of six. Remove five from that, square it. There's another data point of four, remove five from that, square it. Another data value of eight, remove five from it, square it, okay? Um, if you remember, those are called the deviations, okay? We're now going to take the square root of that number divided by four, because n was four, right? When we go ahead and do that, we get 2.236, okay? Uh, if we're going through Excel, if you guys remember, you can use Excel, you can simply type in your data, um, two, four, six, eight, and we should be able to take standard deviation of that. Oh, I gotta hit equals. Standard deviation, population of those values. And you can see that it gives me that. Okay, 2.236, which is exactly what we got. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. If, so th this, is, this is all stuff that we've been doing previously in the past. If we were to graph this information, okay, um, the scores in a histogram, a frequency histogram, okay, we can see that a score of two, okay, so on the, on the x-axis we're talking about our scores here, so a score of two, a score of four, a score of six, and a score of eight. And talking about the frequency in which those occurred, a score of two occurred one time, a score of four occurred one time, a score of six occurred one time, a score of eight uh, occurred one time. Okay, so that's the distribution. Pretty boring distribution, right? Anybody remember what that kind of distribution is called when they're all the same? So it's a U? Uniform. Uniform. So that's a uniform distribution. A lot, so, so we know, we know the distribution of this particular population. A lot of times we don't know the, the distribution of our population, okay? But what we're getting to is that central limit theorem is a tool that even if you do know your population's distribution, and it's not normal, because that's not normal, right? Uniform is not normal. We can still take sample means, and what sample means are gonna allow us to do is create something that is normal, okay? So regardless of what the distribution of the data is, the sample means are going to be normal, which is what we're getting into here in a moment, and I'm gonna try to prove that to you, okay? So now if all sample sizes of two are taken with replacement and the mean of each sample is found, I'm not sure what I'm writing here. The distribution is shown. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you the distribution right here. Um, so the sample is made by choosing one grade, replacing it, choosing a second. So here's the idea of, of what this is saying. If we were to take these scores of two, four, six, eight, take these people and put them in a room and blindly go in and pick one of those people out, bring them out in the hallway, ask them what they got. Okay, they tell me a two. I then put them back into the room, I go back in, close my eyes, pick another person out, they come out in the hallway, they tell me they got a two. So there, I picked the same person twice, right? But that could happen, that could be a sample, okay? Do that, and I could all the different combinations of people that could be chosen for these samples of size two, I could have somebody that scored a two, put them back in the group, pull another person out, and it'd be the same person and they scored a two. But I could do this with a two as the first person, the first score I pick out, but then they could also have been paired with a four. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are all, so if the first person I chose was two, then everybody else would have been a two, a four, a six, or an eight. Those are my options for sample sizes of two people or two scores with one of those scores having to be a two, okay? And then we could do the same thing, saying that one of those scores has to be a four, then the other score would have to be a two, a four, a six, or an eight, right? So what we're saying here is these are those there and those there. Those are the 16 different samples of size two that we could pick. You okay with everybody? Okay. 
if I look at those and determine the means of those, so these are, these are size, samples of size two, okay? The mean here, so these means are our X bars. These are our sample means. If I take two plus two, divide by two, it gives me that number there. If I take two plus four, gives me six, divide by two, gives me that number there, right? So this column here, this mean, these are the sample means, or our X bars. Over here, this is just, obviously instead of making this just two columns, I made it four columns. So these, these are N equals two again, and these are more X bars. Is that okay with everybody? These columns right there now as raw data values, they are their own distribution. They are what we call the distribution of the sample means. Okay? So let's talk about those values I highlighted in regards to their frequency. Let's, let's actually create a distribution for these and see what they look like. If I take two as my mean, are there any other twos throughout here as means? So there's only one two that shows up as a mean, right? Let's look at threes. How many threes are there? Just two threes, correct? Fours. There's one, two, three fours. Fives. One, two, three, four. Sixes. One, Two, three. Uh, sevens, two. And it leaves me with one eight, right? Okay, so that is the frequency table for my sample means. We've done frequency tables for other things, right? For raw data. This is just the frequency, same, same concept as before, but now just with the sample means. If I were to uh, ask you what is the mean, the mean of the sample means. The mean of the sample means. So what does that mean? It means add these sample means, these 16 values, add them together and find their average. So I think I have this somewhere already determined. Okay, so here are our sample means. Okay, those are the values that are in that table on um, the notes. If I find the average of those, so add those up and divide by 16, you see that the average is five, correct? So what we just found out here is that the mean of the sample means is five. What was the mean of the population when we had, remember the population was two, four, six, and eight. What was the mean of those? If I add those together, divide by four, isn't that five as well? And that's what we, that was one of the properties, that was one of the properties up here that said, the mean of the sample means is going to be equal to the mean of the population. Does that make sense, everybody? So a lot, so this, this question, this, this example, deliberately designed using four people so that we can actually come up with the population mean. Other, and, and it shows, it validates that yes, the, the mean of the sample means is the same as the population mean. So that in the next problem, when I don't know the population mean, I can use the mean of the sample means to tell me the population mean. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, next thing I want to do is look at the Standard deviation of the sample means. Okay, so this is a little bit elongated. Okay, this is a long process, so I'm gonna use Excel to help us with this. But our standard deviation formula, square root of the sum of your data values minus the mean squared. But now because it's the sample means, these X's right here are going to be these highlighted values, two, three, four, uh, five, three, four, five, six. Previously, 
when we did the standard deviation of the population, it was just the numbers two, four, six, eight, right? Here it's gonna be a little bit long because we've got 16 terms to deal with, okay? So I'm gonna use Excel to help with this. We've got these 16 values, these are sample means. If I take those values and remove five from each of them, remember those are, that's referred to as our deviations. We're now gonna square those. So it gives me all of those values. Okay, and then we're gonna sum those. So the sum of those would be that right there, so 40. So in my, in the notes that we have here, this stuff in the top, all of that is going to sum to 40, correct? Okay, now if I divide that by n, which is the number of sample means that I have, which is 16, So it'll take 40 divided by 16, gives me that number right there. And if I take the square root of that, I get that number right there. So that number right there is the standard deviation of the sample means. That tells me the spread of my sample means. Does that make sense? Is that number smaller than the 2.236 number, which was the standard deviation of the population. Yeah, so the standard deviation of the population, 2.236, that means that the spread is wider, okay? 1.58 means that the numbers are tighter together now. The spread is more compact. Okay, so that's great. That's another one of our properties that was identified up here. Okay, the standard deviation of the sample means will be smaller or tighter than the standard deviation of the population. We also have this fact here. because we just, we just found this, the, the standard deviation of the sample means by going through this long process of our standard deviation formula. But this is saying that we should be able to arrive at the same value by just doing that. Okay, because we've already the, we've already got sigma, don't we? Sigma we knew to be 2.236. Okay. N, that's the size of your samples. So N for our samples, we we're taking two things, right? In each sample. So as I take that and divide by radical two. Okay, so I'm going to just to eliminate any rounding issues. Um Let's go, let's put down here, two, four, six, eight. So that was, um, those are my data values for my population. So this 2.68 number that we're, or two, sorry, 2.236 number is the standard deviation of the population of those values. Just want to make sure that there's no rounding errors, okay? Because I was going to put 2.236, but I would lose all of this stuff here, right? Okay, so that is, right there, that's sigma. That's the standard deviation of my population. Well, if I take that number, and I divide it by the square root of n, which n for us was 2, that number right there, is the same as that number right there, isn't it? That makes sense? This number found, okay, this number here was found by doing this long standard deviation process. Okay. This number here is found by taking, we still had to use a standard deviation, but it was, a, it was a, an easier standard deviation to find. We only had four objects, four data points instead of 16. But the relationship that we see here is that those two things, those two techniques or approaches are equivalent. So, down the road, we're not going to use this one. Okay? We're going to use this relationship because a lot of times they're going to tell us in the problems what the standard deviation of the population is. Okay? Um, so then, if we know our sample size, we can find the standard deviation of sample means simply by taking the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of our sample size. 
Does that kind of make sense? Okay, now what I want you guys to see here is if we take our sample means and we come up with a distribution of them. So meaning, going back to these being our sample means, right? Okay, and we talk about the frequency of those. When we talked about the frequency of them, these are the sample means, and the frequency of them showed up like that. Well, if I graph that as a distribution in a histogram, and then come up with maybe the probability density function, that is the histogram that I get. Okay? Remember the scenario, the scores were uniform in their distribution, right? Now, if I take the sample means, I take those 16 samples of 2, 2, 2, 4, 2, 6, 2, 8, take those 16 samples and calculate their frequency, their, their means, and then their frequency, it turns into that. What kind of distribution is that? It's symmetric, and if it's perfectly symmetric, Oh, that's a terrible curve, but it's a normal distribution, isn't it? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So if it's a normal distribution, now all the things that we've been talking about in the last couple of days, they're determined probabilities, are at our disposal. We can use them now on a scenario in which the original distribution was either unknown or, in this case, uniform, which was, means it was non-normal, okay? So this is the central limit theorem, which allows us, essentially, to use everything that we've already talked about with the normal distribution on other distributions, okay? Or other populations in which we don't know the distribution. And that's, that's a key concept, a key um, principle for the rest of statistics. Okay, so it's the, that's called the central limit theorem. Tomorrow, we'll run through uh, some examples of um, the central limit theorem, how we find z-scores and normalize it and all that kind of stuff, and um, hopefully make a little bit more sense of it. Okay? But it's key for us um, as we move forward to, to understand that concept.